On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at Direct at gmail.com, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. I just want to say Happy New Year to you, to the listeners, our wonderful listeners. We're very early on into 2021, but already it's starting to feel like a a little bit of a different, knock on wood, a little bit of a different year. And uh, a lot of optimism, a lot of motivation, and a lot of ambition entering this year. Feels good. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Lance, and Happy New Year to you, too, and to our listeners as well. I completely agree. We're starting off this year with a story, a case of a missing person named Archer Ray Johnson, and this is episode two, and Archer Ray Johnson went missing from Brooklyn, Washington on April 1st, 1986, and of course, Lance, this came to us by way of the private investigations for the missing case file. Tell us a little bit about private investigations for the missing. For those of you who do not know, Private Investigations for the Missing is a nonprofit charity organization that was founded by Bruce Maitland, Brianna Maitland's father. Tim and I are fortunate enough to be on the board of this organization. And the primary mission for PIs for the Missing is to help families locate their loved ones when police, law enforcement, other private investigators have exhausted their resources. So again, primarily this is to raise funds for families to hire private investigators in their area to look for loved ones. Now we have to start somewhere. The information for these missing persons comes to us pretty much through social media and our email, and it's vetted by a team led by Jennifer Amell, who is part of this episode today. And a lot of that communication, a lot of that relationship nurturing is done through Michelle Kazuba, who is very active behind the scenes, as well as Jillian Kuzma and Bruce Maitland himself. The first step towards raising the profile, raising visibility for these missing people is the podcast. So long explanation long. What you're hearing now is the first step to raising the visibility. If you have any information about any of these missing people, we always provide the proper contact information in the show notes or during the episode. Today happens to be Archer Ray Johnson. That's right. And this is episode two. And uh, we were reached out to by Archer's daughter, Nikki, and his granddaughter, Taylor. And uh, so we hope to have them on in a future episode to uh, discuss this missing persons case, very mysterious missing persons case. And if anyone has any information on Archer Ray Johnson, he's been missing since April 1st of 1986. He would be 77 as of today. Please contact the Grays Harbor County Sheriff's Office at 360-249-3711. Okay, everybody, thanks a lot for listening. Don't forget to go to investigationsforthemissing.org and follow their social pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the next day, April 2nd, 1986. Pat leaves home at about 6.30 a.m. to go back to the site where Archer's truck was abandoned, only to find out that search and rescue efforts had not even yet been launched that day. 
And the detective asks the question in his notes, did she drive down the spur? Jen, you mentioned the spur earlier in here. That's kind of like a little pull-off. Yeah, yeah, it's a little, like, kind of section in the road or a clearing that a vehicle could potentially go down or you could walk on foot down toward the wood line. Okay, and that was close to where his truck uh, was found? Right next to it, yeah. Ah, okay. It makes you wonder why he didn't park there. Indeed. Yeah, okay. And the detective was referring to Pat when he said, did she drive down the spur? Yeah, I believe so. Um, he, This detective had made a timeline from all of the witness statements, and this is in his own handwriting, so it was a little bit dicey trying to decipher some of it. But I'm assuming this was like a margin note, and it was near Pat like going to see if they had started the search yet, and I think that his note was referring to Pat. Did she drive down the spur when she went to park at that area right and is there an answer in the police notes there is not okay well i think i do think that's kind of interesting too because i wonder if the detective is asking because of tire tracks that that he or she saw down there oh yeah yeah so they do note that later in the report that there were tire tracks down this spur but i don't think they ever definitively matched it to archer's truck i'm not sure they got a make or model on the tire tracks. How far off the road is the spur? How do you know like how long this is? It's because I'm imagining like a pull off and doesn't really go that far into any wilderness or that far off the road. No, it would be pretty shallow. I'm not pretty shallow. Yeah. I'm not totally sure how, how long the spur was, but it would just be like probably maybe a car length or two. It would have to be long enough for somebody to refer to it as down the spur. Yeah. You know, it it would have to be like somehow long enough where some driving would happen. So maybe a couple of car lanes. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did try to look on Google Maps to pinpoint exactly where the truck might have been. But like Google Maps stops like right below the crest of the hill that he disappeared on. Like it just doesn't have a map. <laughs> it did because it's a dirt road. It doesn't it didn't go down there. Google's in on it. <laughs> switch to bing everyone i've been saying it for years <laughs> i'm bing saying it okay so then pat goes to earl and rosa at around 8 a.m so they did they weren't just there she had to go to them yeah they didn't arrive i mean granted it was pretty early i suppose i mean it is pretty early but the previous day archer was up at 6 a.m and then they went to work I think people like this get up early. I think they they get up early and they're out to do what they need to do for the day. Uh, not to mention your brother's missing. So I would put that as a priority for me. Yeah. Yeah, it is definitely a bit strange that Earl wasn't out there already or they didn't have plans to meet at the search area. Okay, Jen, and you have a coordinator's report. So this is directly from the report. Someone named W.J. Stocks was assigned to Archer's case. It's from April 2nd, 1986. The vehicle had already been removed by family and the area contaminated as far as clue location for search crews by efforts made by the family and friends to locate Archer on the 1st and the early morning hours of the 2nd. Search crews were dispatched in a containment effort of the area that is patrolling all the roadways on foot and in vehicles, people that are track aware attempting to locate any signs of persons leaving the roadway or walking along the roadway in an effort to obtain a clue as to the direction of travel taken by the missing person. At this point in time, the situation was being handled as a semi-priority as the subject was known to be in good health and there was no reason for him to be overdue physically or health-wise and the subject was extremely familiar with the area. Yes, that that's just like a little um, snippet from the search coordinator's report. This is just to say that they were pretty thorough on a multiple-day search. Okay, and then detectives did find tire tracks on the spur near uh, near where Archer's car was allegedly abandoned. And, of course, you use allegedly in here because it, it, we're, at this point we're just going off of Earl's word, Earl and Rosa, and, and that's as noted in the coordinator's report. 
Yeah, totally. And like these tracks become important because, I mean, they may or may not be Archer's tire tracks. We're, we're not totally sure about that, as we noted earlier. But when detectives asked Earl about these tire tracks, he, upon first interview, denied any knowledge of the spur. Second interview told detectives that Arch had said he drove down the spur to pick up some wood that he found near the spur. And then in a third interview, he denied saying that Arch had driven down the spur. So we have a track record of him changing his story multiple times. Okay, yeah. Well, how would he know if Archer drove down the spur or not? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, um, I don't know how Arch would indicate that that was the spot. He's like, around mile 16 on Brooklyn Road, there's a spur. I don't know. I don't know how you would, how Earl would um, determine, even if Arch had mentioned this spur, like, why would he think it was that specific spur going off the road? Yeah, this is, uh, to recap, this is very interesting. So there's the spur that's there near where Archer's truck was found. There's tire tracks there. Earl denies any knowledge of the spur in the first interview. Second interview says, no, Archer told me that he went down the spur to pick up some wood. And then later says he did not say that Archer had driven down the spur. Sort of backtracking a little bit, leaving the door open for detectives to maybe make a conclusion that Archer could have driven down the spur. So I guess our conclusion here is that those tire tracks were from Archer's truck. I don't don't think there is any conclusion that the tire tracks were from Archer's truck or not. I feel like if there was anything in the police records, you would have seen it where they say, Earl, did you drive down the spur because those tire tracks match a a Chevy Nova. They made that note wondering if Pat had driven there. Did she go down the spur? Because maybe she might have had access to Archer's truck at some point. I really don't think that it does point to the fact that it is Archer's truck. I think they found a pair of tracks and it was the only sign of life where the truck was allegedly abandoned. Um, So I think they were curious about the tire tracks and if they did belong to the truck. But I really don't think that they had matched the tire tracks because there was like absolutely no mention of that. And like, why would they think Pat had driven there? I think it was referring to her arriving there like the morning after the disappearance in her own car. Like, had she driven down the spur that morning? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think it's I think it's fair to say that the well yeah and i think my determination about this statement here is that earl is definitely lying about knowledge of the spur so there's three things he said he denied any knowledge of the spur he told detectives that archer had driven down the spur to pick up some wood and then he later denied he said archer had driven down the spur so two and three automatically conflict um, and then, but, but also if one of those are true, two or three, that would mean number one conflicts too, because he's talking about the spur in parts two and three. So he's lying in two of the statements. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think like the most important thing you can glean from the tire tracks is that Earl's lying about them. <laughs> okay. And then the next day, April 3rd, 1986, they conducted another search. And those searchers only had anecdotal info about what type of shoes Archer was wearing. The team did find a trail made by rubber boots that they followed to the Gates Line Logging Road, which intersects with Brooklyn Road at the A Line. What, what does that mean? What's the A Line? Um, so, like this area, uh, Brooklyn Road intersects another. It's not an actual road that you would drive down as a as a resident of the area, but like. A clearing that's made for vehicles to like go into the wood and log um, different sections of the forest there. So Brooklyn Road um, forms a sort of A with this logging road. So the tracks would cut across um, this forested area to the logging road. And the, the forested area was typically traversed by human beings because that was like sort of in route to the logging area. Yeah, they're they're not totally sure that those 
prints were arches either. Same thing with the tire tracks. It's not a paved area. It's not a paved path to the other side. So you could assume that it would get muddy there in the rain and maybe some, you know, elements. Uh, so rubber boot prints probably aren't that uncommon there. Yeah. And I think like my belief from just reading the description of the search report is that the boot trail had gone through like a forested area like a a wilderness type area where there was not a path to connect between brooklyn road and this logging road so they would have been squishing through uh, a bunch of overgrowth and undergrowth and i'm assuming mud as well if they were able to to track it like that i just have one more comment about this i'm curious about the use of the word anecdotal that they only had anecdotal information about what type of shoes Archer was wearing. Is that based on people saying Archer always wore work boots or something? Yeah. So they asked his family members what kind of shoes he would wear. Like, is it possible he would be wearing rubber boots? And I'm sure they're like, yeah, it's possible. But nobody like remembers definitively what footwear Arch was wearing on the day of his disappearance. Okay, but on that day, they found a bandana in the drainage area, and uh, dogs were given a scent item from Archer's house, and they hit on the bandana. So that bandana actually did belong to Archer. Yeah, this was something that belonged to Archer, and he, I think, wore or used it as a decoration during his most recent wedding to uh, Pat. But this raises my hackles as well because this area had been pretty thoroughly searched the day before and the bandana was not found um so that leaves it open to like somebody potentially planting the bandana after the fact can you paint a quick picture of this drainage area if you have an idea of what it looks like was it one of those larger ones that you see on the side of the road or was it something like uh like a drain pipe or something so i'm not exactly sure from the notes where this drainage area was if it was near the logging road or if it was next to brooklyn road but i imagine it would be like that little trench that they dig for like water runoff uh, on on some kind of road like that but yeah i'm not not exactly sure where the bandana was found okay and dumb question um because the bandana wasn't there on earlier earlier searches but uh my dumb question is are we sure that the bandana wasn't the scent item that the dogs were given yeah um the the search report explicitly states that they were given a separate scent item from archer's house to determine if the bandana belonged to archer great okay and uh the bloodhound handler harry anderson Uh, was quoted as saying, I don't have any doubt in my mind that if he was there dead, we'd have found him. So they did a couple dog searches, actually, during the first dog search. um, So the dogs picked up a scent near where the truck was found and followed it down Brooklyn Road toward Oakville. And the handlers sort of chalk this up to Archer's scent being blown from the truck as he drives down this road, not necessarily that he stopped at that area and like got out of the car or whatever okay and they they said that his uh truck made for a distinct trail because it was loaded with firewood yeah exactly kind of interesting yeah i never really thought of that okay so they did not find archer's track near the truck dump site yeah they the dogs did not hit on a specific scent or a trail near the truck abandonment site well that's really peculiar yeah indeed it's almost like he was never there it's almost as if the truck wasn't there i mean the truck might have been but archer wasn't interesting okay and there you said there were a couple of dog searches yeah there was a second one after the bandana was found so the dogs caught a scent uh caught a scent of archer heading back toward brooklyn where earl lived but it wasn't near where earl had said the truck was but roughly like a quarter mile away Okay, a quarter mile, I guess, in dog sniff terms, sounds like it's further than it really is, <laughs> um, because you could you could kind of run a, a quarter mile pretty quickly, but 
if a dog is sniffing, that that is kind of significant. Yeah, because a dog can like pinpoint pretty accurately, like within inches of where somebody used to be rather than it's not like they um, the dogs like caught some vague scent of Archer and they only picked it up a quarter mile away. Like he would have to have been a quarter mile away. Was this anywhere around the spur? Mm, I don't think so because the spur was close to where the truck was abandoned. Um, and this was a quarter mile away from that. Okay. And then about six weeks later, Earl told the Olympian in an article that this worried him because he thought someone else might have moved Archer's truck. Yeah, like in between, I I mean, according to his statement, there was plenty of time for someone to have moved the truck. But according to his own statement, again, he saw the truck in the same area where he had seen it in the morning. So I don't know what he's talking about here. And how far behind Archer was Earl anyway? Like, how how much time would would there have been for some random person in town to have seen Archer and decided he wanted to make Archer go missing and then stage his truck? It's like 15, 20 minutes, right? Yeah, it sounds like a f- uh, high school physics problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was never uh, great at those kinds of questions, Jen, but we're, <laughs> we're saying about 15 minutes or so? Yeah, he was 10 to 15 minutes behind Archer. Okay. My my eyes are starting to roll now. <laughs> I can hear them. <laughs> They're rolling so hard, I can hear them. Uh, that's an interesting thing to tell a newspaper. Uh, the Olympian is a, a newspaper local to that area. It's interesting um, that that is now the perception that's out there. It's not part of the investigation, it's part of what the public is perceiving of Earl. Right, right. You're saying something different. Earl's saying something different to the media, and he's saying something different to the police. Yeah. Yeah, that's precisely why I found that notable, that the police report doesn't reflect this. Um, This was merely an article that the family had sent me on the case um, where Earl tells this to the newspaper. So I thought that was notable, yeah. Interesting. What are your thoughts on the keys being in the ignition and there being two people in the car, Earl and and uh, Rosa, and neither one of them moves the truck a little bit off the road when they first see it? Yeah, I mean, they ended up moving it. They just waited a bunch of hours to do so. Yeah, like they don't deny moving the truck because obviously it ended up back at Earl's house. Well, they moved it later, right? Yeah. Okay, but they left it haphazardly on the road the first time yeah yeah they didn't move it then i guess if if we are to believe their story i guess they believed arch was just like putzing around the woods for a few minutes and we'd be back to his truck so they just shut the door totally possible i guess based on what he does right he peels bark and and such so i mean i'm sure he spends a lot of time in the woods and so that was the end of the search efforts they were terminated on april 3rd two days after Archer went missing. I find this weird. That they terminated searches? Yeah, so early. Well, I two two days of searching. Um they they said that they were semi uh you know it was a semi priority because of Archer's state. Um and it doesn't sound like they were getting much help from Earl or Rosa, to be honest. It sounds like they might have known that they were uh being deceptive because how if they weren't, if they were telling the truth completely, I don't think this would be a mystery. Yeah, I agree. I agree that they, at the very least, have more information about Archer's movements that day. It's interesting tactic if they might have thought that Earl and Rosa had something to do with it. I mean, why could you could you officially terminate the search, but unofficially behind the scenes keep a search going? Mm, I don't know how you would hide a search, like a ground search. An investigation, I'm sure they kept uh, going for some to to some degree, but uh, yeah, I guess not physical searches. Yeah, and and like reading through all of the notes and statements and stuff from the police department, it really didn't seem like 
Earl or Rosa were on their radar uh, as far as being suspects. I think they took them at face value and were like thoroughly investigating other leads. Okay, well, let's talk about those other leads and some of the theories in this case. Obviously, in any missing persons case, when you can't tell if there's been a crime committed or not, um, it's considered that the missing person might have walked away from his or her life. And uh, that was one of the theories here, that he that Archer might have staged the truck himself. And then walked away? It's kind of ruled out really quickly, though, because the dogs say he wasn't even at the car where the car was left. Yeah, um, something that just occurred to me right now, and not when I was writing this section, but um, it is possible that Earl could have helped his brother if he wanted to stage a disappearance, and he abandoned the truck that would fit in with the whole Jameson timeline, too, if, like, Earl did help his brother out and leave the truck there on the road, and then Archer left for another life. But I don't think law enforcement really gives too much credence to this idea, and the family certainly doesn't think that Archer would ever leave his family. Uh, Yeah, where would Earl bring him? A bus stop? Maybe he went to live as a hermit. Maybe he just walked into the woods and lived lived as a hermit for a little while. I mean, I think, I, yeah, I think I actually think the the walked away from his life is probably the second most likely thing that happened. You know, because I I do think I do find Earl and uh, Rosa's statements to be suspicious. Um, so yeah, like like we're saying, I think I think if they if they were completely honest, I think this wouldn't be a mystery. So maybe that's true uh, that he could have walked away. Yeah, totally. I mean, that would also kind of drive with Earl's later behavior during the in- investigation as well. He was, like, conducting his own investigation on the side, like questioning people and getting phone calls from random people. We'll, we'll discuss it. but And he told the police explicitly that he was in fear of his life. Earl? Yeah. From who? He wouldn't mention anybody specific is just like he floated some like half-baked theory that somebody had mistaken archer and abducted him instead of earl okay (laughs) but he didn't elaborate on like why someone would want to abduct him either they they must have mistaken me like who's they this random uh elusive they and as far as I can tell, based on what you've put together, he didn't have any significant threats prior to that, right? Like, there was no uh, letters being mailed to him or anything like that? Yeah, no, not, not, nothing that he mentioned to police or that they were able to uncover. But again, the, like, Earl really wasn't on their radar, it seemed. Well, that's odd. And uh, so, but but Earl did have his ear to the ground, sort of. It sounded like he was hearing a lot of town rumors, huh? He heard one about a drunk driver that could have hit Archer driving from Brooklyn Tavern, and uh, we, which is very close to where they were. Um, but again, that's early in the morning, too. Indeed. And so what other local gossip was there? There was one theory that was floated around, and it was mentioned by the journalist who was covering this case in the Chinook Observer, um, but that Archer had been what's called stumped. Have you guys ever heard of that term? No. It is, I guess, a backwoods way of hiding a body in which you uproot a tree, put the body under the roots so that the roots continue growing over the body, thus obscuring it forever. So the you push the tree over to some degree and then and then push it back and then it continues growing. Okay, I didn't. I wouldn't uh, have imagined that would work uh, quite the same. But yeah, apparently it's a thing either of folklore or it's been done before. I'm not sure, but I will note that the area around where the truck was allegedly abandoned has been heavily heavily logged since '86. So I don't know how many miles up and down that road, um, but just looking on Google Maps, it seems like kind of barren around where the, where the road is. So if he was like abducted and killed in that area and then stumped, like they would have either found a body out in the woods or found it under a tree. 
I feel like this piece of gossip is almost indicative of the 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 citizens there, the people of the area, uh, people who do a lot of logging. I'm sure that method of hiding a body was known and probably at a bar or somewhere where people are, you know, eating lunch together or something. They start talking about that guy, Archer, who went missing. Someone probably said it wouldn't surprise me if he got stumped, you know, and that's probably the uh, genesis of a, of a rumor like that. Yeah, that just seems like a gruesome thing that might travel through gossip. Yeah, I could see that. And uh, so tell us a little bit more about this feud with the neighbor, Fred. And this is all according to Earl. Yeah, so we mentioned earlier in the first episode that the Johnsons, uh, specifically Earl and Archer, had a feud going on with this guy, Fred March, who owned some property abutting Earl's property, or like in that general vicinity. And often the brothers would trespass on Fred March's property, and he got tired of it, so tired of it, in fact, that he uh, filed charges against Archer specifically, because I think Archer had shown him, like, a little bit of lip. Uh, They got into arguments quite frequently, um, and he did drag Archer to court, but as we mentioned before, he was, Archer was acquitted um, of trespassing, and uh, I don't think... So so the detectives spent a long time investigating Fred March. There was a rumor that Archer's body was in a well on uh, Fred March's property, and Earl was one of the biggest proponents of Fred March being involved in his brother's disappearance. But the, uh, the detectives searched uh, a lot of Fred March's property. They searched a well. They searched um, what's called a Quonset hut on his property. It's like a kind of a temporary structure that you would use to like house tractors or cars or, you know, machinery of that type. Um, and they found nothing whatsoever to connect Fred with Archer's disappearance. Is, uh, is Fred still around or is there any members of the March family? Um, Fred is not around. He has a son that I tried to reach out to. There was a lot of talk in the detective's notes that um, Fred March was like a quote-unquote paramilitary type. Like, he was just kind of sketchy. He like had a bunch of guns and stuff, but they accounted for all his guns. Like, nothing was amiss. There was nothing, nothing that made them, you know, nothing that was noteworthy as far as the rep- police report. And it sounds like he let them search and everything like that, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he um, he actually provided contact information because he was about to go to work on a fishing boat in Alaska. But he was like, if you need to reach me, like this is where I'll be. So it seemed like Fred March had nothing to hide. Isn't it funny the uh, difference between people who may have something to hide and their behavior and someone who doesn't have anything to hide and their behavior where they say, yes, please search my property I'm, by the way, going to Alaska. Here's how you can contact me if you need anything. As opposed to uh, three different versions of something that would just seemingly be a simple uh, answer. Like, do you know about this spur? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when compared to Earl's statements, it seems like Earl's very convoluted whereas Fred March is like no I didn't have anything to do it do with it you're welcome to search anything you want and on the same token like Fred wasn't you know shy about saying that he didn't like the Johnsons that you know they he had trouble with them a lot yeah well he can't really lie about that there's court records and uh but Earl continued until his dying day perpetuating the story that Fred had uh something to do with Archer's disappearance huh um, yeah, Earl Earl um, maintained that Fred March had something to do with his brother's disappearance for all of his life. Okay, and then there was a mysterious encounter at a restaurant bar called The Beehive. And there was a woman named Sue who contacted the Johnson family with a story told to her by a strange man at the bar. This is already sounding like a spooky development. It sounds like a David Lynch movie. Right, at The Beehive loud jazz playing strange man walks in so what happened at the black i mean the beehive 
Sue is unaware of the day, but police believe that it could have been between April 1st and April 7th. But Sue was drinking at the Beehive restaurant when she met a man who claimed to have known Archer. He said he got into a fight with Archer a few weeks before. Then he had his friends wait for Archer 12 miles down Brooklyn Road, intercept him, kill him, and bury his body. He laughed and said searchers would never find him. And then Sue admitted to taking this man home with her that night. Uh, She doesn't recall his name. She uh, described him as being between his 30s and 40s, between 5'9 and 5'11, medium build with a beer gut, dishwater blonde hair that was balding, sideburns, a shadow where he may have recently had a large beard and mustache. And he mentioned working as a machinist for Boeing and uh, who was also involved with drug running in the Brooklyn Oakville area. So that's that's a whole lot of story that he's he's bringing. Yeah. Um, so who's Sue? So, yeah, Sue just like inserts herself into this whole story. She didn't go to the police first with this story. She wanted to find Earl first and tell him the story. I mean, first of all. This strange man with blonde hair and a beer gut uh, is certainly sharing a lot (laughs) with a stranger. Like, I run drugs. I killed somebody. (laughs) That's a good point. Yeah, that's a bit bizarre. Not not completely unheard of, but yeah. No, if they were drinking and he was trying to, like, impress her in some weird way, I guess it's not too far-fetched. And Earl and Sue met up, and that was also at a bar. And they, uh, so they talked about what, what happened. Uh, apparently they talked about what Sue had witnessed and, uh, but they, they proceeded to get fall down drunk. So Sue described Earl as being angry and unwilling to believe her story that Arch could have anything to do with drug running. Yeah. Earl, I guess, maintained that Arch would never be involved with something like that. But his behavior, as described by Sue to police, who did track her down, that he arrived angry and, like, kind of unwilling to hear her out. But then they just, like, got super drunk. And she noted in her witness statement that Earl was, like, unable to even stand up after they were finished speaking with one another. Okay, so Sue actually does exist because the police tracked her down. Does the man, the strange man exist? Did they ever find out who this person was? So they interviewed, I think, three or four, not entirely certain, people who fit this description, roughly. Um, All of which turned out to be dead ends. So they they never found this person that Sue uh, had the story about. But I'm kind of suspect of this woman, Sue, a bit. I mean, not only did she have, like, a drunken conversation with somebody who was, like, trying to sleep with her, so he could have said anything, I don't know, Um, but she also, as noted in the police report, she she also um, had admitted to having information about an entirely unconnected missing persons case out of Aberdeen, Washington, so it seems like maybe she's just a person who likes to insert herself into cases. Right. The the options there would be uh, she she did it right. She had something to do with with Archer's disappearance and maybe the, maybe another one or she's just kind of maybe a little bit of an inserter. Yeah, I would say the inserter one sounds more likely. Mm-hmm. OK. And another theory is that Earl killed Archer and hid his body on his girlfriend Rose's property in Brooklyn, Washington. Yeah, this seems to be the one that Nikki and her daughter Taylor think holds the most water. Because, I mean, as we discussed here, um, Earl's statement about what happened that day on April 1st just doesn't really match up. So I think the suspicion, as far as the family is concerned, is on their own family member, unfortunately, back on Earl. In a conversation with Nikki, she said that she thinks it's most likely that uh, Arch went over to Earl's house and the two started day drinking together, like probably pretty early in the morning and then got into an argument about what we don't know. Uh, but maybe Earl lost his temper and killed him. Had they had a history before of uh, fighting with each other when they were drunk? I know that they both had bad temperaments when they got drunk, but were they um, inclined to fight with one another? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the whole family, at least the brothers, 
of the like the Johnson brothers had um, a history of fighting with one another. Betty Archer's ex-wife, she she knew the family a fair amount and said that the brothers quote had a bad influence on each other. And what about Rosa? Is she still around? No, she passed away. And her property is uh, quite large, huh? Seventy three acres. Yeah, it's huge. Wow. Okay, so do you know who owns it now? Uh, yeah, it's it's owned by a new couple now. I know the property had initially passed on to Rose's son, but and he's still around, but uh, he sold the property to this new couple. And are there areas on the 73 acres that you know of which are accessible uh, by something other than a car or maybe even accessible by a car, and then you would get onto a... Um, like a tractor or a four-wheeler or something? Um, Yeah, so I had a conversation with a journalist who was covering this case, and in his conversations with, I'm not sure who, but somebody local to the area, um, said that Earl had said, no one better look under the tractor. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that comment. You said that it was a, a journalist who covered the case. Where did he hear that? I don't know. Okay. Was that in a newspaper or something? No, it wasn't in the, in the newspaper. This was like uh, via my conversation with this journalist. He's, he said it verbally. He said that Earl said no one better look under the tractor. Yeah, I don't, I don't okay. know. Okay, <laughs> so it could be rumor. Okay, interesting though. And then, Jen, you did a FOIA request and uh, got some information back. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it wasn't my personal FOIA request. It was a request made by uh, Nikki and Taylor. Um, They had initially requested information from the Grays Harbor Sheriff's Department, who was lead on the case, but then I think it occurred to them to reach out to the Pacific County PD uh, for information as well. And they returned back a single document that was extremely interesting because it was never anything that... Uh, Nikki or Taylor or anybody had heard before. So apparently a witness came forward who was named in the document, but I won't name them here, had received information through hearsay. So somebody heard this information and then related it to the witness who then went to the police with this information. Um, But they heard that Archer had died that day while at Earl and Rose's property, but there was no mention of how he died Um, if it was murder or an accident. And then, according to this witness, Rosa, Rosa's son, and Edie Pringle, the neighbor, disposed of Arch's body in a well on Rosa's property. And as far as we know, to this day, Rosa Buterak's property has never been searched, nor has the well in question. The what? The well has never been searched, and this was a witness statement to police this was made in the early 90s it was like a few years after archer went missing but to my knowledge the police never searched that property and it actually came to a different county it came to pacific county and the investigating agency is gray's harbor so maybe that's actually a communication issue and may i mean i guess it's possible gray's harbor never even heard about that that's, yeah, that's what I thought initially, too, but there is a tiny note at the bottom of this report that said, like, information was given to G-H-S-O, which oh, great. I'm, I'm assuming means Grace Harbor Sheriff's Office. Okay, and then, so we still don't know if it was searched, or you know that it wasn't searched? I'm pretty sure it was not searched. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think there, there just, like, wasn't any traction on this case. I'm not sure if they like had no reason to believe this witness or if it wasn't enough to get a warrant to search the property. I'm not sure what the reasons were for, for not searching it. You've seen this uh, FOIA? Yeah. You've seen the statement? Yeah. There's an address for this uh, this well location? Uh, it just says on the Buterak property. But I'm assuming if if this couple that owns the property now is so nice and amenable, then they would perhaps consent without a warrant to search this property. That would be great. I I agree. I think if it's uh, even simply searching that well, that's an afternoon of, of searching really could put an end to a, a decades long mystery. Yeah, totally. I think there is definitely 
room for movement in this case. Rose's property, Rose's old property, is is pretty large. I mean, it's not saying if you search the well and he wasn't there that he wasn't elsewhere on the property, but I think there needs to be some kind of uh, action taken on this information. It's strange because this witness's statement implicates Rosa, her son, and Edie, but not Earl. That's a good observation, Jen. That's pretty interesting. Do you know if Earl had any physical uh, damage to himself afterward? Was there any report that he might have had like a black eye or, you know, a, a bruise or something? Not that I know of. Um, there's nothing in the police report about, you know, any physical injuries that Earl had sustained. Um, the only thing of note that I learned from Betty, Archer's ex-wife, um, is that after previously, like, previously the relationship between Betty and Earl was, like, pretty estranged. They didn't really talk to each other. They didn't have a strong relationship. But after Archer's disappearance, Earl repeatedly went to Betty and asked her if she needed anything, if, you know, it was, like, being very um, overly friendly and interested in her life and if she was getting by okay without Archer, which I thought was strange because Betty was no longer married (laughs) to Archer. I mean, she did have a daughter by him, so perhaps that was his intention to, like, look after uh, Nikki. Um, But apparently when Earl, later in his life, he was in the hospital in palliative care, Betty had every intention of going to visit Earl on his deathbed hoping for some kind of confession to the fact. These were her words. On her way to the hospital, Earl passed away. So he never said anything. I asked if he maybe would have left a letter or something in his will or any information, and and she didn't know. But Wow. And and who was that? Who said that? That was Betty. That was Betty. Okay. And um, would Nikki or Taylor or even perhaps Betty uh, speak with us on the show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Definitely Nikki and Taylor are very excited to come on the show and share some of their experiences trying to solve this 34-year-old case to find their missing loved one. Well, that's great. Thank you to to Nikki and Taylor for uh, putting yourselves out there and uh, and your family uh, out there as well in uh, in an, an effort to try and find Archer. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think this is definitely a solvable case in terms of like maybe not knowing exactly what happened to Archer, but recovering his remains, which would in turn give the family some closure. So I think it's incumbent upon us and all of our friends of the show to maybe put some pressure on law, law enforcement to open this case back up. Yeah, it's a, that's a good call. And we obviously have uh the an invite an open invite for them to come on the show and and talk about this because on the when when we're reading this document it feels like it's so tangled and intricate but like you said even if the body is found and you don't have all the answers i feel like just the location of the body will untangle a bunch of this and 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 you'll have something where you can have you know at least in for them they'll have a scenario that plays out in their head involving the solution of what happened to their to their father. Yeah, I mean, Nikki even said that directly to me. She was like, listen, all I'm interested in is bringing my dad home. If you have any information, please contact the Grays Harbor Sheriff's Department at 360-249-3711.